Hey everybody, welcome to the Friday 3D Printing Community Hangout. This week we're going to be talking with quite a few educators that and makers that are involved in 3D printing in the classroom. Now that classroom could be kindergarten through 12th grade, it could be college, it could be libraries, it could be maker spaces. Um, we've got a good selection of educators with us tonight to talk about the challenges to 3D printing in the classroom, um, the benefits of 3D printing in the classroom, and just what their experience has been. We have a varying level of experience in bringing 3D printing into the classroom, or even in some cases, if the uh, guests would like to, they can branch out into just technology in general, what helps them, um, and how it also can challenge them as well as their students. So let's go ahead and get started with the intros tonight. Let's start off with Chris. Hey everybody, good evening. Chris here uh, with the East Coast Rep Rap Fest team. Um, you can follow me on social media at mcrispy1 or more importantly, follow Earth at Earth2018. Um, check us out on Eventbrite, www.earth2019.eventbrite.com. Um, very interested in tonight's topic. Um, one of the things that we are doing with Earth uh, is we are doing inside some tables specifically for education. Um, so we're hoping to get some schools to come out uh, and demonstrate what they're doing uh, with 3D printing and education uh, this October. So I'm really looking forward to the talk tonight. Thanks, Chris. Next up, we've got Dave Randolph. <laughs> Hello, David Randolph over at printedsolid.com. Find us on the social media, you know, printed solid, or printed solid on all the social media stuff. And uh, yeah, we do a lot with educators and stuff like that. So most of these guys I've worked with, nor they've come to my shop or, you know, they've bummed car rides for me. So I'm forward to talking with them. Thanks, David. And of course, I'm Matt from How I Do It, uh, and also organizer of the Friday 3D Printing Community Hangouts, along with Martin from 3D Printed Iceland, and Chris Pileski as well, um, helps organize all these streams, get our guests together, and prepare topics. Um, a couple real quick points for the Friday night hangouts that have come about in the last week or so. Um, in the last two weeks after the Jimmy Duresta episode, we started uploading an audio-only podcast version of the stream which is literally all the audio unedited ripped from the stream and re-uploaded to soundcloud that is available currently i've gotten the approval for uh, google podcasts on android and iphone um soundcloud of course and spotify <coughs> we're currently listed on um i believe tune in may have just emailed me today so if you use tune in you can search for f3d pch or friday 3d printing community hangout um, the other news information for the Friday night hangouts, we now have a new website, f3dpch.com. It is still pretty basic, but we're working on getting more and more up there. You'll eventually actually be able to go there and pull up the live stream at any given time, um, as well as some information. Topic suggestion forms are on there. Um, if you'd like to become a guest or recommend a guest, you can also fill out that form. And if you have questions on how you can get on the stream or um, any other questions about the Friday night hangouts, you can contact us through the website. So let's get on with our guests. And um, guests, I'm gonna go through you guys left to right on my screen. It may be a little bit different at the bottom of your screen. So let's start out with Josh. Hey everybody, um, I'm Josh Ajima, uh, designmaketeach.com. And um, currently I work at the uh, Academies of Loudoun, a public STEM high school in Virginia, which which just opened. So nobody has heard anything from me on my blog or YouTube channel for the past year because uh, I've been doing two jobs. I'm the instructional facilitator for technology and the makerspace uh, technology teacher. So next year, there's going to be two people doing what I'm doing uh, this year. But I'm an experienced educator. I've been twenty some teaching for 20 some odd years. Um, my maker credentials, I was part of the Make Magazine review team in 2014 and 2015. So I've published uh, digital fabrication reviews and 3D printing articles in Make Magazine. I've been featured on Thingiverse, Pinshape, uh, Adafruit, uh, 
presented at World Maker Fair in New York and gotten a best in class ribbon of, uh, on a talk on 3D printing and education. Um, outside our art fair in New York, I got second place in the design competition with a Tinkercad model against uh, architects and designers from, uh, from around the globe. As a maker educator, um, I won the US Department of Education CT Makeover Challenge. So we, uh, at my last school, we earned $50,000 in cash and prizes to renovate a, a CT classroom, uh, one of 10 schools in the nation to, uh, to win that prize. Uh, so we bought 3D printers and um, made a whole mini fab lab there. I'm a Stanford Fab Learn fellow, so I've contributed it to a new book, Meaningful Making 2, where I have some articles about digital fabrication, 3D printing, and there. I was Formlabs 3D Design Award winner for Top Educational Model. Uh, I'm involved with the Construct 3D Academic 3D Printing Conference, which will be at Rice University in February next year. So I uh, encourage everybody to apply to present and attend that. And I think I'm uh, also the Vista Innovative Educator of the Year. And uh, I'll have some of my students at Nova Maker Fair on June 2nd. And so we're encouraging everybody in the DMV area to come down to, uh, to the Nova Maker Fair. Okay, next up we've got Don. Hello, everyone. I um, guess I'll start with a little bit of background. I'm a mechanical engineer, graduated from Penn State in 1990. And um, I remember distinctly the first time I saw a 3D printer uh, was an STL printer. And I didn't realize it was only, I think, about two-year-old technology by the time it came uh, to the Penn State campus I was at. And... Uh, Two companies each put $500,000 in each for this million dollar printer, and they had Penn State run it 24 7. Um, so it was an STL or stereolithography machine. And, um, you know, used uh, 3D printing in product development. I was usually a manufacturing engineer. So a lot of times the first prototypes uh, came off of industrial printers. A lot of the projects had 10 up to $50,000 worth of 3D printing prototypes. Um, I just never imagined in the 90s that I would buy a 200 printer bot um, and put it together and operate it at home. Um, so starting in 2013, that kind of started on folding and um, got deeper and deeper into the kind of rep wrap hobby and 3D printing. Um, about that same time, um, I left industry um, and started teaching at Thaddeus Stevens College and start up a new program called Electromechanical Technology. Um, so it's a two-year associate's degree and my graduates work in manufacturing facilities and they're the frontline maintenance mechanics, technicians, first response to when a machine's down. They have to troubleshoot it mechanically, electrically, and also logically. The computer code behind the um, robotics and automation. Um, so it's been an interesting journey um, the last five years. I didn't want to get too heavy into engineering, realizing my background was mechanical engineering, and uh, I didn't want to use something I perceived as a hobby too much inside of um, my electromechanical um, background. So um, it just... Uh, it's kind of been interesting each year, a little bit deeper into 3D printing and um, use it in the curriculum. Uh, so in the fall, I have 25 freshmen in a class called Manufacturing Fundamentals, and uh, they are learning 2D, and then I have them teach themselves 3D. I don't have any curriculum time available for them to do 3D modeling themselves. So they're um, teaching Fusion 360 to themselves, and uh, because each year they do capstones as a sophomore in their fourth semester, and we've had some projects that have as much as 75% 3D printed content, 3D printing deeper and deeper, and I want them all to be able to produce their own prints, slice their own prints, find optimum orientations, figure out when to use supports and things like that. 
um, because I don't want to support all the different student projects. Um, so my goal this year is to, um, I have funding allocated that I'll be able to spend in July and I'll get eight jelly box 3D printers um, and the students will build them and uh, they'll learn how to produce models. And um, in many cases, they're not gonna be designers. So it's a little bit different focus than would be in a more um, design-based program. Um, one of the things I see a 3D printer as is a miniature factory. Um, it has PID loops, which is something my students need to understand. It often has electrical problems, often related to where wires are flexing due to movement, which is a very common problem in industrial robotics. Um, temperature sensing devices, power transmission, converting rotary motion of a motor into linear motion for the X and Y and Z axis. Um, there's just a treasure trove of learning opportunities. And it's ironic, I probably walk back and see the robo that I started with, which was, I think a Kickstarter model I got from Matt. Um, so, and upgraded that over the first couple of years. Um, but that was kind of nice because we threw the hood open often and had to fix stuff. And I could put a burden on my students to troubleshoot that. Um, so that's kind of what I do in a nutshell as far as 3D printing in the college environment. I also do a lot of outreach, um, got to attend Kins 3D uh, that Josh mentioned last year. Uh, with the automaker um, pioneer, as I think Josh is. Um, so um, it's, it's a rich environment. I just networked with a guy named Tim McCallan in, in Aaron, Ann Arundel Community College. He did something called a low-cost mechatronics trainer that was funded by NSF. Um, I had students last year build a new set of students this year actually get it working. Um, and it its original goal was a thousand dollar budget. Uh, they're hitting more like 1500 to 2000 for the purchase bill of material. Um, but it's a filling machine. It was designed, they call it uh, kind of the Wonka machine to show how you use an auger and you can measure out and fill these 3D printed cups and then advance them and then sort them um, logic. And um, it's a real tangible, non-threatening, um, example of technology and goal ultimately is to give these kits to high schools and teach high school teachers how to assemble. Um, if they have 3D printers, they can print their own trainer. Um, and then they don't even know code or anything. They would follow the wiring diagram and up code that's given to them and they can draw high school students into mechatronics. So I'm pretty excited because that's um, a lot less money than a lot of the equipment that we're often using in the lab, um, which means I can have one for every student or one for every three instead of, you know, one for 25 students. So that's kind of the angles I come at 3D printing from. Awesome. Thanks, Don. Next up, we've got Paul. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Poxtellis. I'm uh, a professor at the University of Maryland, so I actually teach biochemistry. So I'm a scientist. Um, I got my undergraduate degree at the University of Kansas, so sort of over Joe Mike's way, um, and my PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I got interested in 3D printing really more from a science perspective. So working in the lab, we have lots of equipment, um, and there were lots of times when I felt like I needed to make some adaptations or change things. So um, after you know following 3D printing for a while without actually getting into it, I decided finally that I was going to get a printer to have in the lab to do sort of um, little projects for, for building things that I needed, stands for microscopes and things like that. And after getting it and sort of seeing the potential of that, um, it immediately got me thinking how I could use that for teaching. So. From my perspective, one of the, the big problems was trying to teach, and so this is at the university level, but one of the things that I, I feel that students have a hard time with is um, spatial awareness. So we teach about molecules and atoms and how they're connected together, and they always see those as two-dimensional things on a page, as two-dimensional representations, but they're two-dimensional representations of 3D things. Um, and I don't know how many people 
in the, the stream or, or in the panel here have had to take organic chemistry. But back in the old days, when you took organic chemistry, you had to buy a molecular model kit in order to be able to um, sort of spatially understand what's going on with the reactions that the, the instructor would be talking about. Uh, that's sort of fallen away for any number of reasons, one of them being that they're kind of expensive um, and it's a lot harder to, to use them in, in that type of setting now. Um, so as soon as I, I thought that, I began to, to think of ways that I could potentially use a 3D printer to sort of solve this problem. Could we make molecular models in a cheap way that could be used for educational purposes? And there were some challenges with that, which got me into doing some software development for, for ways to do that. So I've done some Blender add-ons to be able to take uh, molecular models out of molecular visualization software and convert them into to, uh, 3D printed 3D printable models uh, in the sense that you can split the models up into smaller pieces to make them easier to print. And then actually taking that and using them in the classroom. So for example, as, as somebody who teaches biochemistry, I, I teach a class that's related to all things DNA and RNA, so nucleic acids. And so one of the things, the first things that I did in an educational setting is actually use 3D printing for an exam. So I would do a 3D printing of a, of a DNA base pair which I would then give to the students along with their exam, and they would have to identify things on that 3D printed model that I gave them and answer questions on their exam. So that's kind of how I started. And that's now transitioned into the point where we've, uh, I've established a 3D printing lab uh, in our department, and this is being used for a number of different things. So I use it in my classes for doing these sort of molecular model kits that I can give to students. And there are other classes now that are using this um, where the, we actually have students coming into the 3D printing lab to um, both um, sort of do the, the modeling work to, to make the molecular models and then 3D print them and then assemble them to be able to understand things like molecular symmetry. Um, the whole process of, of doing this is, you know, I, I just saw 3D printing as a tool uh, for, for making these types of molecular models, but I've really now gotten into the... Uh, the, the hardware side of it. So this is all stuff that I'm like learning on my own and, uh, and I'm self-trained with, but I'm really enjoying the whole RepRap movement and building my own 3D printers now as well. So um, I'm, I'm going to try to impart some of that onto the students that are using the 3D printing lab to, to keep them from being uh, uh, scared of, of mechanical things, which I find students often are. Um, yeah, so those are those are the the main things I'm doing 3D printing with. So I'm it's less about teaching 3D printing, and more about using 3D printed objects as as teaching aids. One of the uh, cool things and things I really enjoy about being able to talk with Paul um, on Twitter and at the Print Solid meetups and things like that is with Paul having a background in chemistry and understanding chemicals. There's really interesting things that Paul has shown. He has a YouTube channel that, like you said, you don't do a lot with it. Um, but there's a he has a, a good video on bonding, uh, chemically bonding PLA prints to each other using paint thinner or paint stripper, I believe it is. Um, it, it's neat to have somebody who, you know, 3D printing wasn't the, or technology, so to speak, technology wasn't the main focus it was just a tool in the education. Um, Paul has a good outside um, set of knowledge to bring to 3D printing that I find really interesting, which is one of the reasons I wanted to get Paul on here as part of our panel, so. All right, yeah. so we've got Joe Mike. I I'm alive. Right for when you walked away, you know that. Yeah, you always do that. I think you've got it locked on. Uh, no, I'm good. I'm good. I so I'm like running two laptops. I'm like watching the chat on this one, and then I've got my streaming rig for this. Anyway, um, I'm Joe Mike Terranella, and I am nowhere near as cool as the last uh, people who just talked. Uh, and I guess I'll start by saying that I've got a background in mostly electronic engineering. Um, 
thanks to my grandfather and a heavy uh, influence in computers in general. Uh, so obviously I've got my YouTube channel. Um, the YouTube channel's genesis was to start teaching what I had learned when I started to mess with 3D printers. And so any little trick I learned or any new product that I was messing with, you know, went up on the channel. Um, I never at that point considered it a like, you know, a thing that I was going to try to grow or do anything like that. It was simply to teach and uh, help people along. And since then, it's become more in depth. Uh, I actually started a business that teaches companies and schools uh, and other institutions um, about the technology. So, for example, there are a couple of school systems around me that have got 3D printers in the classroom with their STEM programs. And, uh, you know, I hop over there and kind of walk their teachers through how to use um, their 3D printers. It's mainly, you know, setting expectations of, you know, this thing isn't like what you saw on, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It's not going to print something in 10 minutes. Um, and it's also, you know, really working with slicers and working with the hardware, stuff like that. Uh, more recently, I just started at Mid-Continent Public Library as the network admin. Um, but I went ahead and I brought in two of my Prusas into the office. Uh, I did that very... <coughs> excuse me very intentionally to um, kind of expose more of the people in the headquarters to the technology because one thing that main continent is lacking compared to other library systems is maker spaces um, and not even full-fledged maker spaces but any kind of 3d printing or subtractive manufacturing you know they're uh, you know, catchphrase is, you know, providing access. That's that's what Mid-Continent wants to do is provide access to as much as, as possible to the to the public. Um, and the makerspace movement was kind of shunned away at Mid-Continent because they looked at it as kind of like a, a niche thing that some of the, the more uh, flashier uh, library systems were taking. Like, uh, you know, we go over to Johnson County where there's a lot of money and their library system has makerspaces and 3D printers everywhere. So I brought my printers in and started kind of demystifying uh, the fact that 3D printers are not only affordable, they're they're relatively easy to use. They can be, you know, people can be trained. I have trained um, pretty much, not everybody in the department, but most of the people in the department on how to use these 3D printers. So now not only am I printing on my printers, but a lot of the other people in the uh, office are printing on my printers as well. Um, which has spawned into the conversation of how do we, you know, how do we convince the higher ups that this is something that's needs to be brought out into the public and taught. Um, so that's starting to look like integrating with youth services at uh, the for the entire uh, system. We have 31 going to be 32 branches, um, and kind of slowly sneaking it in. So I've been doing a lot of uh, teaching of the staff, but I also have begun teaching the public. Uh, they allow pretty much anyone in the community if you uh, can prove that you are sufficiently knowledgeable on a subject, you can sign up to teach courses on, on nights at a specific branch or you can bounce branches. And so I've been just teaching 3D printing to the community. You know, the the misconceptions, the realities, what kind of printers are out there, what what the technology can do, and basically what uh, what to expect. And the reception has been, you know, a lot larger than I think even I anticipated at first. So I think that's a really good indication that um, the area is is primed and ready for some maker spaces. So right now my main focus is to try to continue to educate the uh, the people who run the library system that I'm a part of. Um, 
not only that, but to educate and to expose as many people to the technology as possible in order to get it out more into the public to where we can teach the public about it and that they have access to it. Um, so yeah, that's that's my little slice of, of what I do. Um, so yeah, and now I'm getting text messages. And <laughs> all right, all. Thanks, Mark. Okay, and last but not least, we've got Jacob. Hello, um, my name is Jacob Ayers. I run a fab lab at the Indiana School for the Blind. Um, I have a I have a real hodgepodge background of stuff that got me here. So um, to understand the bigger picture, you have to know if you haven't met me before at Mur for Earth. Um, I am legally blind. Um, I have really powerful glasses. I use a long white cane and I use heavy screen magnification to do what I do. Um, so I got into printing in 2013. Um, in April that year, I went to a conference that was all about uh, tactile graphics for the blind and how you implement those in education. And uh, they had a maker bot representative there with a beautiful rep too. And then there was this old guy that just kept rattling on and on and on about how the Stratasys Connex technology was going to change how we do things. And uh, I got hooked then and obsessed. And uh, later that year in September, I got a hold of uh, one of the plywood printer bot symbols uh, that had the uh, fishing line for timing belts. Um, and I got hooked with that little thing. And, uh, I went in search of uh, a place where I could really go hone skills specific to this. And uh, at the time I was pursuing a mechanical engineering technology degree um, at a satellite campus of Purdue. And uh, I was near Chicago and within a commutable distance. And I approached the field museum and said, you know, I'm interested in printing. I'm interested in accessibility for people who are blind and visually impaired. And I'd like to explore the possibility with you guys of combining those two things and seeing what it would take to set up an access program in a museum. And um, that was all in an email to their CEO because his email was on the internet and why not just go for the top? And uh, 20 minutes later, I got a response back, yeah, come see us. And boom, I'm in the door of a major institution who wouldn't tell me no. Um, so I spent about a year and a half working with them in their exhibitions department, conservation, their education department, public programs. Um, they paired me with my primary person um, was... Uh, one of their anthropology conservators in their Pacific collections. And he taught me everything about metrology with laser scanning, photogrammetry, CT scanning, micro CT scanning. Um, we took animals to hospitals and CT scanned them. We CT, CT scanned mummies and skulls and stuff. Coolest thing I got to do there was open up a mummy on live TV. Um, so we did a pilot program with that where we took all kinds of things that I digitized over the course of a year and printed out. We had, I had my, a couple of desktop machines and then we had a, the original re 3 d gigabot from their Kickstarter. And uh, we made some large di dinosaur skeletons and some other stuff. Um, so, and we concluded that where we did a one night, like night at the museum, spend the night kind of thing where um, we took 20 blind students from Indiana and Illinois that were in elementary and middle school. They got to come to the museum and they got to have specific programming meant for them so they could actually experience what these objects were. Um, and so that ended in the beginning of 2015 and 2015 was the grand search for a job for me. And, uh, in the fall of that year, me and a colleague of mine that teaches at Butler University, we approached the Indiana School for the Blind here in Indianapolis. And uh, I had graduated from there in 2012. 
So the superintendent had been following all of the crazy that I'd been working on in the years following. And we approached him with this idea of making a fab lab that was there at the disposal of the teachers uh, to create tactile models for them to use with their students. Um, and we walked into this thinking we'd have to fundraise to do this and it would take a year or two to get off the ground. And in a 15 minute conversation, we went from nothing to, we can hire you part-time. We're going to start in three weeks. Uh, so November of 2015, they threw me in a closet in the library. I had two MakerBot clones and an i3 knockoff. <clears throat> And we bootstrapped it off of that for about three months. And uh, three months into it, they decided they were going to make me a full-time employee. This is going to be a permanent thing. And uh, 2016, we raised about forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of funding and built a nice lab with a large X carve, laser cutter, drones for photogrammetry, nice cameras for photogrammetry, structured lights uh, scanner. Um, we had 10 Robo R1 Pluses that over the course of two and a half years I destroyed. Um, and um, so that, that, that gets us up to about now. And uh, so with what, we've, what we do there, um, teachers come to me with whatever crazy idea they have for a model and I find a way to make it happen, whether we uh, laser cut it, mill it, or print it, uh, sometime a combination of all the above. Um, we will first go out and scour Thingiverse for stuff or other model sites. If it, if it exists, we'll take it, we'll modify it or whatever. Uh, if it doesn't exist, we will scratch, I will scratch model it, sculpt it, uh, design it in Fusion 360, whatever the job entails. And then we manufacture it. Um, about a year into the program, we started uh, bringing in students uh, as student worker, apprentice kind of things, um, since I didn't have an actual teaching license. So they were just kind of employees. Um, so right now we have uh, three students who are working there. One student is totally blind. He does all of our post-processing. Um, we use PolySmooth primarily, and so he does all the prep work for the polishing chamber, so sanding, remove supports. He does a fantastic job of it. Um, we have another kid that has low vision, and he's just kind of a jack-of-all-trades. He can step in and model. He can fix machines. He can run machines. He can do post-processing, but he hates it, um, which I don't blame him. Uh, and then the final student we have, he is considered deafblind. He has a cochlear implant on his left ear and has a little bit of hearing there. No, or his or his right ear. He has no hearing in his left ear, and he has vision in this kind of tunnel of his left eye. And this kid can CAD. He can fix machines. Uh, he can run machines. Uh, he can do it all. And he's the he's the superstar of the lab right now. Um, so we're we're expanding our our stuff into a really, really, really big program. So uh, a friend of mine, Grant Michael, uh, got a job with Shining 3D a couple months ago. And uh, a month into the job, they call him up and say, we have 220 machines for you to donate. Uh, who do you want to give them to? So he calls me at 3 a.m. from China on WeChat. It's like, guess what, Jacob? Guess what you're getting? So uh, two weeks ago, we had eight pallets of printers show up. And uh, that's triggered kind of a big uh, snowball of events. And uh, Monday we have half a ton of PolySmooth showing up. So uh, with that, we're, we're going to expand what we're doing. And uh, I have enough hours now to get a vocational teaching license. So next year we're going to have formal programming. And uh, we're in early talks with uh, SME people about making a modified uh, program for their additive manufacturing fundamental certification and building a whole year long thing of that and having a formal CAD class and stuff. So yeah, that's me. Awesome. Jacob, 
I, I, I don't mean to pile it on, uh, you know, too thick too early, but, you know, I just have to say it blows my mind what, what you're doing. Um, just wow. Um, you know, bringing it in at that level, um, bringing the students into it, you're providing a valuable service to the school uh, that you graduated from just seven years ago. Um, incredible, dude. Thanks. So, as you guys can see with our panel of guests tonight, we've got a pretty good range of education in 3D printing. Um, Joe Mike had to jump off to take care of his daughter. Um, if he can, he'll jump back on after a little bit to keep in the conversation. Um, just real quick, to find Joe Mike, um, go to youtube.com slash Joe Mike Terranella, I believe, or just search Joe Mike Terranella to find his content. Um, or Mojike on Twitter. Um, so one of the biggest things that I hear from educators who are looking at 3D printing and the biggest question they have is, you know, not so much where can I get a printer or how can I get a printer? They know, you know, you apply for grants, you enter contests, you, you do different, different things like that to get the printers. Um, their biggest question is about curriculum how they can utilize 3D printing in their curriculum. Um, Paul, you don't specifically teach 3D printing. So can you go into a little bit more in depth how 3D printing works with your curriculum? Yeah, so uh, to pick up with the idea that you had there about the questions that people ask about, I actually believe that, at least from what I've seen, but that's the biggest challenge um, of getting the 3D printing into a classroom um, because it starts off with people maybe even having an idea of something that they might want to do, but it's the next steps going from an idea to some kind of, uh, you know, doing the CAD that they need to do or doing the modeling that they need to do in order to, to make it something that would be part of the curriculum has been the biggest challenge that I've seen so far. You know, in, in my case, I, I built a, a printing facility with, with nine printers with the idea that, that we would have some volume that people would want to print things for their classes. Um, and it turns out, you know, it gets minimal use. I use it for my classes. We got another class that comes in and, and does some printing in there, but it hasn't really caught on yet. And I think a lot of that is that it's hard to get people to know what what exactly they want to do and then have the model to be able to do it. Um, in my case, you know, I, since I do a lot of this already, um, I, just as like sort of a follow up in the background, um, what I do research wise is I determine structures of biomolecules. So we use a technique called X-ray crystallography where we have to grow crystals of some molecule that we're interested in, we shoot x-rays at it, and we can determine what it looks like in three dimensions. So I'm doing lots of a sort of three-dimensional things already. So I have these molecular models of these atoms. And so then for me, it's about, you know, figuring out what's going to work well in a class. Um, I teach real basic things. So, um, you know, doing something like building a DNA double helix. Um, Everybody knows what a DNA double helix looks like, but until they actually hold it and they and they see it in their hand and they're looking at it, they don't really get an appreciation for how it's working. You know, I can describe things about it, um, but until they actually hold it and rotate it and touch it, um, they don't quite have the same level of understanding. You can get some of that from a computer, but if you're actually holding a physical model, you get a lot more of it. So I don't know if I answered your questions. I sort of went on a tangent there. But, um, you know, I think that it really is a, a, a there's sort of a disconnect right now um, to getting those things into curricula. Now, I think that was that was kind of right along the lines of what I was looking for as the answer is the way you're using it is as the 3D print is an aid to the education. It's a way to, you know, like you said, you can take pictures in with X-ray, see the molecules in 3D, but to actually physically hold it and look at it 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 answers that that need for people who have a hands-on sense of learning as opposed to uh, book learning um, 
that's pretty much exactly what I was expecting from you for the answer for that. Actually, and, and that's the response that you get from students when when you talk to them about it and you give them a, a molecular model and they actually get to hold it and rotate it. They're like, oh, I didn't I didn't really appreciate that. You know, when when you're talking about you know, we're talking about DNA. We talk about things like sugar puckers, and it's like you know something's off a little bit. And then you can actually show it to them, and they get to hold it up, and they get to look at it in front of their face. You know, it, it makes a it makes a really big difference um, as opposed to just being something again that's either drawn on the paper or they're rotating around on a computer. Is there for in your field of study? Is there good websites and resources to find? things that aid you in the classroom. I know a lot of what you're doing, you're writing the code to actually produce the model that then gets printed. Um, are there resources that you've found that are useful that another educator who may not have the programming knowledge or the modeling knowledge? Is there anything you can recommend for that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, of course there's Thingiverse. You can always go there and you can find some things that you're looking for, but there are, I, in the last three or four years, you know, in, in all things, there's been a pretty big explosion in 3D printing, including in, in what I do in sort of the chemistry, biochemistry education field. So there are journals where, you know, people publish scholarly articles um, about chemistry education. So there's one called the, the Journal of Chemical Education, which is probably the biggest one, where if you go there now, you can really find um, lots of different types of things that people have worked out including the molecular models uh, or various types of models to be able to assist in in various things in chemistry classes. Um, Josh, what about you? What's some of, some of the examples of how you would use 3D printing? And I know, Josh, you do CNC and you just got a shaper to play with or you're getting one. Um, what's some of the use cases that you use 3D printing in education? Uh, yeah, so in in my high school, it's a, uh, a public STEM high school, and so we have an, a number of different programs. Uh, we have CTE classes like health and medical science and cosmetology and automotive repair, but we also have specialized uh, uh, science track and an engineering and entrepreneurship track. So. Um, we have different things feeding in. So for instance, in health and medical science, they're studying prosthetics. So we ended up printing like a, a full cyborg and a full Phoenix uh, prosthetic hand so that the radiology students who are uh, learning how to do x-rays and study bone fractures and things like that could understand how prosthetics actually work. We had, you know, kids design, uh, just going to Thingiverse, uh, printing out those models, printing out a, a dog prosthetic, but then in that same class, they're working on like a medical innovation project. And so they're, they're tweaking the, the design some, um, but we had a kid just in Tinkercad design a model for, uh, for users who have uh, Parkinson's or uh, other disabilities where uh, they have hand tremors. And so the students designed uh, a structure where someone could hold the pen and use gross motor movements to, to, do, the, uh, to do the writing. And so, you know, working with a, a broad spectrum of things to kind of solve those those particular health and, and, and medical issues. Um, the the engineering classes, I, I think, are a lot more straightforward because, you know, they're they're building things. And so I know you, you said uh, some teachers are like, why? Uh, why 3D printing? I think those are the same teachers who's in their classes. They're probably not making anything. And so I think the broader question might be, why making or why hands-on learning in my, my class? Uh, obviously this audience uh, appreciates or has had in their, their lives somewhere a hands-on learning experience. And they, we all see the value in that. But um, the thing that we're seeing now is a, a lot of the teachers who are, are coming into uh, the profession have only known standardized testing. They've never seen a before high stakes uh, state SOL testing. So their whole education career um, has been about the test and not the making the things. Sorry, I can't. Sorry, so uh, Apple Watch has been. Um, and so we have engineering kids and, and you know, they're, they're making things. They're making, uh, you know, uh, Rube Goldberg machines. They're, uh, 
They're you know making wheels for for paddle boats. They're making uh, a uh, we had a lot of screws being done for amusement park rides. So the project engineering project was to do amusement park rides. Uh, we've had solar challenges. Um, a lot of the things that on the engineering side are kind of challenge based things. So they're making hovercraft um, and they, you know, they'll try 3D printing and but 3D models are a little bit he too heavy for that. And so they end up trying different materials. And so the digital fabrication tools are all kind of explorations for, for that. Um, and then our AOS, uh, our science track, they're doing uh, independent research projects that uh, <clears throat> they utilize 3D printing for just elements of the structure. But our, we also have students investigating 3D printing as, uh, as a field of research. So right now we have a student who uh, wants to know what's, what's happening inside the model as it's printing. And so they're printing part of the model then embedding thermistors into the print and then continuing the print and then measuring in like eight different locations, the temperature profile of the model itself as, uh, as the printing process continues. So they're trying different infills and, and different uh, patterns. Uh, I've had students who 3D printed uh, spinal discs to try different, different shapes and different modes of, of 3D printing. And so, 3D printing structures, they they want me to be responsible for a, a filobot because they want to make their own filaments and add, add new materials to it and test the mechanical properties of uh, of that. Um, I keep telling them that that's a lot more challenging than they, they think it is, but uh, they kind of think you just put the stuff in, in and you get high quality resin out. Uh, but you know, it's it's that exploration of different materials. And so one of the things that's been cool recently is that uh, I'm coming back to a lot of materials that I gave up on like in 2013, 2014. Uh, but you know, like uh, TPU flexible filaments print a lot nicer than they used to and polycarbonate and uh, having, you know, a fifth generation printer is, is a, a much, better experience than having the old laser cut cut printer bot for like some of these high-end materials. And then having access to something like the uh, the Formlabs form printer and trying the different resins and things has, has certainly opened up material science research possibilities for the kids. And then sometimes there were a factory, like the, they wanted these little test dividers to hold pieces of cardboard so that the kids could take tests and not uh, be tempted. So we made, I made like 300 of these at the beginning of the year. So um, a little factory, our entrepreneurship class, um, they need small production runs where they do 25 or 30 of a thing so that they can get it out into the hands of some co customers. So we had a kid who wanted to, or a, a team who uh, built something called an eco disc, which is like this little hemp based filter. So you put the plant pot on top of this, and then you have a 3D printed piece underneath that helps the drainage happen. And so we got wood fill and the wood fill printed beautifully. And the kid went in to Tinkercad and by hand designed this thing that looked like it was generated algorithmically. And, you know, we, uh, we ended up printing like 30 of those um, so that they could have those out to the customers. So like we kind of hit the range of things in, in, our, uh, in our STEM programs. Yeah, I'm not hearing you. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, let's jump over to Don. And how are you guys utilizing 3D printing? If you were talking to an educator who's interested in 3D printing, but they're not sure how they'd use it, how are you guys using it in the classroom? Um, like I mentioned, every year I do more. Um, I was leery of getting too engineering focused and away from the technician emphasis of our program, the hands-on. Um, but uh, Paul mentioned spatial awareness or um, things like that. And one of the things I think is interesting, um, you know, more than 75% of my students are, are male and probably spent more time playing video games in a 3D environment than they did anything else. But they have zero spatial awareness unless they played Minecraft unless they took classes like Josh is offering in high school, um, 
more than half of them, close to three, have very little spatial awareness. So they don't know a millimeter from an inch, from a quarter 20, from an M3, um, and all those things really, really, really matter. Um, so I start out teaching um, uh, calipers, and I just focus on digital calipers. Um, we don't even I spend a lot of time on micrometers. I just, I really want them to be proficient using calipers and getting um, repeatable measurements. And one of the things I stumbled onto early, um, I believe was originally published by Tinkering, and then I think it's disappeared or been, I don't know, shown up a couple different places, but it's, um, it's basically an uncertainty of measurements uh, lab and it gets them some repetition and using calipers and they find out they have a little bit of variation themselves. And, and then I can dive into all kinds of other things. Some of them, um, I don't know what to call them, but uh, more soft tools uh, like a failure effects analysis and a fishbone diagram. And um, I don't warn them, Hey, I'm going to intentionally radically change from really cheap PLA to really good PLA, or I'm going to run your parts on three different machines. And so I set up this iterative process where there's uh, three shapes that fit into each other. And I, I even start off, I just say, um, the customer wants you to improve that. And it's amazing to me, most of them don't come back to, what do you mean by improve? And they all kind of intuitively figure out, I want them to fit together. Um, but then the next iteration I can in introduce, um, interference fit, transitional fit, and slip fits. Um, and so it's, it's, it's incredibly simple. I, I could print them with my fishing line driven uh, printer that Jacob mentioned all along, just crank them out. There's nothing challenging about the 3D print, but the fact that it has in inherent variation, um, I haven't done this, but I've thought about intentionally screwing with the X and the Y calibration to, um, force them to think about, well, I should know where the X axis is on a part that's symmetrical because it could be different than the Y. And if I measure them all and I know which one's the X and I compare that statistically with uh, that population only, I might see something. Um, so it's something every year I kind of dig a little bit deeper um, and I see my students have um, a lot of, it's a lot richer learning than um, could be otherwise. Um, so that's kind of one of the beginning points of 3D printing. Um, and I really try to let them do all the girlfriend, mom, um, whatever, cosplay. I don't allow. <laughs> um, and every year people want, oh, just it's just grips for my pistol or whatever. It's like no weapons. <laughs> don't get me in trouble. You can't get me tossed out of this universe or this college. But um I, I, so I encourage a lot of individual, um, whatever they're interested in, if, if they're doing 3D printing and their own models, then I think they're getting huge value. Um, so that's kind of the beginning point in the first semester. And we only have them for four. In the fourth semester, if they've kind of continually built up their modeling skills, um, and we do some mechanical design and we do some T-slot extrusion, um, like 80-20 stuff, um, but if they're, if they've been curious and they've taken the extra effort, I'm only going to say maybe 10% of my students do that. Um, but if they do that, they become the workhorse of their capstone team, which is usually three students and they're printing brackets. They're printing all kinds of things that five years ago, I would have thought now nah, we can't print or we'll print and we'll have to replace it. Um, what I find each year is we find more and more creative uses for 3D printing. Um, and sometimes it just buys us time until the weld shop can get a weldment for them. Um, and it kind of fills that space for fit, form, and function. And they can conceptualize something and they, they know if meters or if it should be 15 or whatever. Um, they can answer a lot of questions more uh, quickly and fluidly along the design process, mechatronics, capstone. So, um, that's kind of the beginning, really, really simple measuring parts, seeing how they vary and just the variation of a 3d printer. It's like I said before, a miniature factory, and it seems like it's doing the same thing over and over and over again, but there's a standard deviation. There's statistical 
um, lessons and producing a hundred of the same parts that Josh did for those cardboard holders for testing. There's a treasure trove for uh, mass production um, of statistical variation you could do on something like that. There wouldn't be a lot of direct application to his use case, but um, in manufacturing, you know, doing Six Sigma things and standardization and um, just knowing how much contribution your measuring system um, is kind of faking you out to your actual production. All those things are really, really valuable things that 3D printing allows me to kind of make real that I just don't think even, I guess I could mill out. I, I just think subtractive, any of the other opportunities are just not as um, easily applied as 3D printing. Um, so that's kind of how real simple and as much as measuring the parts and trying to think about why the part might vary um, and all the different sources of those, man, machine, material, and method. Um, and everybody on this uh, Hangout, how much you can affect something with slicing. And a lot of the YouTubers have done great videos on all those. Um, that's a really valuable thing because every manufacturing process has the same insane number of errors. And some of them matter a lot and some of them matter a little. And if you're going to produce um, a Boeing 737, you're going to have certain things that matter a lot, the variation of something. So um, manufacturing depends on understanding all those nuances. And so 3D printing allows me to do that kind of desktop manufacturing and make a lot of those learning things very rich. Um, but spe spatial awareness is that um, I've realized each year more and more that my students don't have and they can't a technician without it. And 3D is a really quick way for me to jumpstart that spatial awareness. Cool. Um, you touched on it, Don. I'm gonna, we had a question from the chat from the, uh, Ron, the happy extruder. He asked, what methods are you using to bridge the student's understanding of the software component to the 3D printer? Um, from a firmware standpoint, is that where that question's coming from? Or um, I think he's like talking about Marlin? Like software to the slicer to then getting everything oh. to the 3D printer. So it's interesting. I have a student that's now working in a military production facility of CNC subtractive and he made the mistake which i feel is my issue as his instructor but he sliced for one machine and ran it on another machine and it was about the time he landed that job and him and i i know i gave him that lecture a year ago but him and i spent 15 minutes at the whiteboard and i talked about the tool chain and i said the the mistake you made here was five cents worth of element no big deal you, you need to understand camming um, and how the tool chain works because it's almost identical and subtractive as it is um, additive. And there's added complexities of tool changers. Paul gets some of that, um, but some of the tool changers he'll work on will have a hundred different tools. And sometimes they're machining under like almost cryogenic conditions. Um, air coolant, water coolant. I mean, there's, again, just all this rich amount of variables. So, yeah, that tool chain, um, that's the one instance that came to mind as soon as you kind of steered that question that way. Um, understanding the tool chain um, and industrial robots run off a of G-code, uh, maybe a little bit different flavor than um, Marlin um, or most of the 3D printer world. But if you understand G-code and you've poked around in G-code and edited G-code a little bit, you're very closely um, ready to understand what's going on with machining or subtractive or robotics and um, all the things that happen with G-code in those worlds. For people who, um, who aren't aware of other CNC machines, um, such as routers, mills, things like that, um, what are some of the, just kind of, can you touch on what the differences are between the G code that a 3D printer uses versus a, a subtractive CNC. Um, I mean, you have the obvious, a 3D printer starts at the bottom and goes up. 
a CNC subtractive CNC starts at the top and works its way down in most cases. Um, but what's some of the other differences uh, as far as, you know, 3D printing, we have slicers to get from 3D model to uh, 3D print or file to put to the 3D printer. What's the differences between the G code and process that you have to go through for additive versus subtractive uh, manufacturing? So, Josh, or somebody that does David, uh, <laughs> a lot more routing and, uh, and, and again, I've, and I've worked uh, as a manufacturing and engineer in a machine production environment with CNC uh, lathes and grinders and stuff. But um, the couple of things that come to mind in robotics, coordinate systems are often driving a lot of what you're doing. Um, in subtractive, a lot of times the jigging and the fixturing and knowing where that is relative to your tool um, and then you have offsets. If you have 100 different tools, you have 100 different offsets, um, and you got to touch those tools and know exactly where your tool is relative to your piece. And then you have speeds and feeds. Um, when things go wrong, they go horribly wrong. <laughs> and, and the worst 3D printer nightmare is nowhere close to most of the bad wrecks in machining. Um, you just have a lot more energy involved and a lot, a lot of ugly things that cost a lot of money happen. Um, so a lot of times you're doing a lot of simulation and um, checking out your code, double checking. Um, those are the kinds of things that come to mind. Um, but I, I, I'll defer to some of the more, uh, uh, and, and I don't think, you know, Pico, Xcarve, uh, all the, you know, they're just, I think the same things that are happening in, um, the DIY world is, is very similar to what's happening in the production world. I have a friend who used to work in a sign shop, and you know, a lot of it's how do you hold stuff down, how do you make sure you know where it's at, um, and then you get a repeatable result. And um, So I think there's a lot of similarities, um, and uh, there are some few big departures, but I'll, I'll step away and let an expert take over. Um, Josh or Jacob, do you guys... Feel free to, to jump in, guys. Um, give your input to that question. I, I've got something to say on the spatial awareness thing. Sure. So it's it's interesting that hearing hearing your guys' perspective, working with mainstream students and um, and spatial awareness being a serious issue, um, because me working with blind low vision students, it's the complete opposite. Um, you know. A blind or low vision student has to have superb spatial awareness of knowing where things are at, knowing where you are in space and how, how all of that interacts together. And, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny hearing that where vision is a deficit in your particular case, whereas here with, with mine, it's, it's an added bonus of this skill in figuring all of this out and how it works. Um, so yeah, that, that's all I've got to add to that. I, I can, so, you know, comparing the visual uh, vision being a deficit with spatial awareness that, uh, that listening about the, the blind students having, um, uh, an advantage there because they have to be aware of that all the time makes perfect sense. Um, doing mechanical work when I can't reach a screw or a bolt, I can't see it, but I can reach it. A lot of times you close your eyes and you right. let your hands tell you what's around and let you find the bolt that you're trying to get onto. So that, that makes perfect sense. As soon as you started saying that, that's exactly where my mind went. I'm like, I just realized I do that all the time, <laughs> reaching into a dark hole that I can't see and grabbing a bolt or putting a, a screwdriver on a screw that I can't even see it, but I can feel what I'm doing. Um, and closing your eyes makes you concentrate on the spatial awareness without actually seeing the space. Right. So. And and a lot of that, you know, obviously that's that's mental mapping. You're you're trying to make a mental map of what's going on. And in the case of, 
from an educational perspective for me, it's that students, when they're looking at something that's two-dimensional on a page, what they lack is the ability to take that two-dimensional thing and make it three-dimensional in their head. And so that's where having like a, you know, I, I didn't, don't have a lot of molecular models with me, but, you know, having something like this, you could draw this as a bunch of carbons and some oxygens, but un, until you actually, you know, are, are rotating around, you don't get a sense for how it sits in three dimensions. Yeah, I remember back in high school in science class, um, drawing out molecules as you were learning about mole the different compositions of molecules. Um, everything was 2D. So you had a circle with more circles around it or something along those lines. Um, but everything was flat. Like you see one of the 3D models on Thingiverse is the coffee, the uh, caffeine um, molecular structure to hang on your wall. And it's perfectly flat. Well, that's not actually how it is in real life. Though, th though it's actually pretty close to being flat. <laughs> 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 of course, I picked the one that's on my flat. <laughs> um, but being able to, even just you holding that one up, Paul, like I have no idea what molecule that was, but I think you did say it was carbon. Um, but, you know, the fact that it is truly a three dimensional thing, it's not every molecule floating around there isn't flat like it is in the textbook. Uh, you get yourself muted, Paul. Sorry. Uh, I believe this is CBD, uh, you know, the, the molecule that everybody's raging about for various things. So the, the cannabidiol, diol, uh, yeah. <laughs> Josh, um, going back to the differences with you doing CNC, at, um, subtractive CNC versus additive CNC, what are some of the differences that you have to convey to the students when they're using one machine versus another? Yeah, I think the uh, the the first big break is really the the laser versus the three D printer and doing the the flat two D two D stuff. And so I I think when you move into C and C, the uh, I guess the for me it's mainly uh, you know, you, you put your 3D model in the software, you press the button and uh, a file goes out to the machine. So I don't really look at the, the G code that much, but uh, like I throw kids at 3D printers because I'm not concerned about hard crashes, right? Uh, but I would never throw my, uh, throw a kid on the four by four foot uh, CNC machine uh, without really carefully going over and, and previewing their, mo uh, their model because the tool geometry and the the interaction of the stock material bad things can can happen very very quickly and so uh you know i, I think the kids are are really good at creating uh creating models and kind of imagining cra crazy things um i think as a as educators and facilitators is is uh us saying hold on let's let's see how would a machine actually have to come in to uh to make that thing like how does that happen? I think on the 3D printing side, um, like one of the ways that we have kids start looking at that is like, okay, this model that you want to print is going to take 24 hours to, to print and it needs a lot of support material. Well, what if we rotate it 90 degrees? Uh, slice it now, let's look at the preview. Oh, it takes 16 hours. Like what changed, what's different now? And I, I think we've all had those aha moments when we've taken a model and just rotated it and seen, oh, this this is a much better way to approach this because the machine doesn't have to do all these sorts of things. So the laser straightforward, but then with the CNC, um, realizing that it's not just the bit that the bit isn't an infinite uh, length, right, and that you can't do overhangs and there's there's tooling to actually worry about colliding into uh, into things. Uh, that's where having those preview models to to look at kind of kind of helps them. Um, but you know, we don't have a, the kids don't do a lot of the, uh, overhangs where they want to do complex, uh, CNC work just yet. Uh, luckily most of the stuff they wanted to do is kind of, uh, flat pack stuff. Uh, we're also getting a, a, um, uh, water jet. So we're getting an Omax, uh, proto max water jet. 
And that's going to be very interesting because to see how things that they might want to see and see, we're just going to be able to kind of to cut a cookie cutter out that that shape. And hopefully that's that'll be an interesting comparison of uh, laser, 3D printer, CNC, water jet, as far as the capabilities and materials that, that each can handle. What would be the easiest machine? When you start out with a student for the first time that they've never used a CNC anything, um, and, and obviously 3D printers being in that CNC category. Um, I know a lot of us refer to 3D printing and we refer to CNC and most people who's in the 3D printing community, a lot of times when people refer to CNC, they just mean a CNC router. Um, what's the, the order that you build the kids up in their experience with things? Final cutter, make a sticker for, for your device uh, is, is the quickest and easiest way, right? Make a vector file. Um, variety of different ways. We have kids make mathematical models and then they build like Pokemon logos with, with graph equations, cut it out on the vinyl cutter, slap that sticker on the laptop and they carry it around all day. And every day they see it and they think about uh, like how that model was designed. Then I think from there it's, it's 3D. Uh, it's probably, probably a tie between the laser and the 3D printer, but uh, you know, that same model that you did on the vinyl cutter goes on the, uh, on the 3D printer and you cut out some acrylic and now you have a keychain. Uh, we're doing tiny houses, all sorts of things like that. Uh, then over to 3D printing and then uh, for us, this, the CNC and the, um, the water jet are, are the higher up on the tier. Uh, mainly, and that's mainly when the kids want to do um, harder materials. They always want to do like titanium or carbon fiber or or something crazy, like right from the get go. And we're always trying to say, well, let's prototype in PLA and then try polycarbonate and then try uh, aluminum. And you know, so some of some of that C, that CNC digital fabrication hierarchy is kind of based on um, the how easy it is to to kind of do in the classroom, how quickly the expense of the materials, all that, all that sort of stuff. Um, so as you were talking about the, the differences in that when I was in high school in our metal shop class, we had a s small CNC router um, capable of doing milling out aluminum um, that even in the first year metal shop, we had access to. And thinking back to that, we really had that that thing was old enough the software that we were using you were typing in all your g-code coordinates in the dos prompt there was no slicer there was no in importing a vector i literally sat there with the design that i wanted to do had it drawn up and then put a coordinate grid all over it that then i had to write in a notebook all the code because of course you had to sit there during class punch in the code and print it because the computer wouldn't save your code. Once you printed it and rebooted the computer, your code was gone. Um, <laughs> the school at that time, the school you had to, in order to use that, you had to buy your bit. The, the school would provide it, but you had to pay for it. So that when you snapped it off, you bought another one. The school wasn't out the money for the bit. Um, that was kind of your in maker spaces in in school now you have to go through a so to speak certification for each piece of equipment that you want to use um i know make 717 in lancaster pa that in order to use any piece of equipment in there you have to take a few classes on it first and be approved by the instructor to use it independently or supervised or whatever back 15 years ago in high school it was here you buy the bit if you break the bit, you just have to buy another one if you want to keep using it. Um, what do you, what does the school do now? Is that still the way it is that things like the CNC, you, the student purchases the, the bit or pays a fee for the bit if they break it? Or does the school just, it's an expendable item and it, failures are going to happen? How, how does that, how's that approached for any of you guys? Well, we're a new school, so we just kind of kind of suck it up at the moment. Um, but uh, 
some of the things like I, I had a, a Robo C2 that uh, got given to me. And so uh, I've taken that and put it out in the, in the library. Uh, so I've tried to make tool, try and acquire some tools that are outward facing and public face places for the kids. Um, the, I have a, a Bantam mill that a kid really wanted to make uh, their own circuit board. So I basically spent 10 minutes getting them up and running on that mill and then said, watched him do his first project. And then he's been using that in the classroom on his own for, for a couple weeks now, uh, milling out circuit boards for a high altitude balloon launch. Um, but some of it is just, you know, the, the fail safes on the equipment are a little bit, uh, are, are easier for, us as hobbyists and makers, we've benefited from this and our students are benefiting it. The distance, the difference between MasterCam back in the day and VCarve now is it's just night and day on how easy it is for, for students to, to quickly and safely get up to speed on some of the tools because the software is, is, uh, is so much better. So uh, everything that we're benefiting from in the past five years as far as access to uh, uh, to digital fabrication at home, uh, we're benefiting from in, in the schools. And so it's not as big of a deal when, when a kid breaks, breaks a bit because, uh, you know, the software kind of keeps them from doing a lot of things uh, that are wrong. The auto Z height uh, stuff and touch off and that sort of thing uh, helps out. And uh, I keep stalling the kid on going into bit breaker mode because he's like, oh, I want to... Uh, I can do this. And I'm like, it's called bit baker, breaker mode for a reason because you're more likely to, to damage stuff. So why don't you get a feel for how the tool works uh, in kind of safe mode before you, you really start pushing the envelope? Uh, Jacob, for you guys with uh, teaching blind students, what's some of the challenge? Did he jump off for a second? Okay, I'm here. Oh, you are. Okay. Your picture went away. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, it look, looked like the corner of the chair sitting there. Um, how do you guys approach that as far as, you know, with the, the disability of being blind and not being able to, uh, not necessarily blind, but legally blind, um, how do you guys overcome teaching a student to use the printer or use a CNC, um, what kind of like training do you guys have on that before you just let a student go? Um, so everything we I do is on a case by case basis, just because the range of abilities and disability levels that we have is so broad. Um, Pretty much what it boils down to, if, if a kid has usable vision and can use a computer or use a phone without any special modifications outside of mag magnification, um, they can do everything in the lab. Um, if a student is beyond that scope and doesn't have usable vision, um, we'll they don't get to do everything. Um, and we, we just, we focus on different things. So um, actually the, the most accessible machine that we have is our laser cutter um, for a totally blind student to learn how to operate. Um, so when we do small production runs of like Christmas ornaments or stuff for our donors, um, that's, that's always a blind student task where we've, uh, We've took all of the physical buttons and we've marked them with these raised bubbles and the raised bubbles identify, you know, these are, these are the important buttons that you are concerned with. And with that, you know, we teach the student how to, you know, interact with the machine and opening up, loading material, zeroing the tool head to where you need to cut, um, framing it to make sure what you're going to cut fits on the material you have, setting your origin points, uh, things like that, and then running the job. And then when the job's done, you're done with that sheet of material, harvest all your parts, put new material in, repeat process. Um, now, 
I all I'm always standing there over their shoulder because they're not gonna see when the fire happens, if it happens. Um, so, uh, but other than that, they they can do all of that on their own. The only physical thing that I need to do is select the file, the DXF file that we're gonna cut, and as long as they don't turn the machine off or hit uh, the escape button everything's going to be fine and they can just go about what they're doing and crank it out. Uh, CNC, we haven't, we're, we're just starting to really get into using our X carve. Um, so we haven't dug deep into that yet. Uh, with the printers, uh, the total, totally blind students, um, they are typically my maintenance guys. Uh, so I, I've got, one student that can tear apart a flash forge, get it unclogged and put it back together in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and you said, and you said that one's totally blind. Yeah. Yeah. This, 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 this goes back into that spatial awareness thing and yeah. learning, learning the, you know, physically how the assembly of, you know, a Mark eight extruder works. Um, you know, doing a purge, like, you know, what, what it feels like to properly feed in the filament, you know, with, with, with the Mark eight extruders that have the PTFE liner in it. If you, if you push the filament in briefly and then pull it out real quick, you know that your filament's going to swell and it's going to get jammed bef up and cool before it leaves the, the end of the barrel when you're, trying to unclog it so you know we we go through that whole thing of like you know if you're doing a filament swap you need to push it in you need to hold it for so many seconds then you purge it quickly once and then pull out real quickly and then you don't have to you know go and take the whole damn thing apart so but if they mess up they have to fix it so that's that's how we roll that's actually kind of nice is you know not only do you get to use it but if you do break it now you've got to go into tech mode and figure out right how to be sustainable a little bit with it and be able to repair what you did exactly well and it it, it gets into a deeper thing with blindness where blind kids are told most of their lives don't touch things you're going to break that and it, it forces these kids to confront this fear that society has instilled in them and overcome it to, you know, actually get something done. And o overall, the whole project that we've had there, it's, it's been that big thing of like, it's okay to touch this. You know, three years ago when we started this and we started introducing 3D prints into the classroom, um, students were afraid to interact with them. They're like, I'm going to break it. I don't want to touch it. You know, I don't want to interact with it. And uh, we, we just finished a project with the museum where we took a bunch of 3D scanned objects. We made classroom sets of objects. And uh, they did a field trip to the museum yesterday. And seeing this, this growth over three years of them going from, I'm afraid to touch this, I don't want to interact with it, to this is made for me. I'm going to own it and I'm going to enjoy it and learn from it. You know, it's, that's, that's a huge step in education. Hey, so, Jacob, um, what do what do your students do on the design side? I've have uh, some teachers for the visually impaired who want to make manipulatives, manipulatives for their students, but I'm like, why aren't your students designing things for, so do you have any ideas for K-12? Um, so my, my two students that can CAD uh, are what are considered life skill students. Um, they're not academic. They're not on an academic track. They're just focusing more on daily living skills. Um, and both of them, both of them are high school aged, but are reading at like a second or third grade level, uh, but they can CAD. So we, both of them now function fairly fluently at like a first year drafting kind of person's level uh, in Fusion 360. Uh, they can sculpt 
rudimentary stuff in Mesh Mixer. Um, so we both both of them we skipped Tinkercad. One kid, the the deaf blind student, uh, had to start in me- in Mesh Mixer, and then eventually we worked once once he got the the spatial bits of you know how things interact with each other. Then we made then we made the jump to fusion. Whereas the other kid, um, we we sat him down day one, and in fifteen minutes we went from nothing to he's sketching and extruding and putting fillets on, and he just went wild. So, yeah. Did if these right? kids can do it, those kids can probably do it. But once again, the thing is. You got to have some level of vision to do it. Is there is there something that for visually impaired um, that are on the farther end of visually impaired to no vision at all? Is there any products on the market for them to do three D modeling? I guess really the only thing would be three D only. Thing out there that works is um, OpenSCAD. Um, there's a, there's a group of people at the uh, NYC Public Library Assistive Technology Office, and they have they have mastered uh, 3D modeling with OpenSCAD using a screen reading device. So it's all totally non-visual, all coded. Um, they have to do it kind of through a back door. Um, they have they have Notepad plus um, plus piping into OpenSCAD because OpenSCAD isn't totally accessible. Um, so, what about using things like maybe you m- mentioned it and I missed it? What about things like OpenSCAD? Um, yeah, yeah, OpenSCAD, yeah, OpenSCAD, OpenSCAD. I, I always yeah. get it mixed up. Yeah, that, that's the one. Yeah, I think that's the slicer, slicker, uh, slick 3R or whatever debate there. <laughs> um, yeah. Like, I, I haven't personally jumped into that with my students, just for the fact that I'm not a coder, so I don't even know where to begin. So until we have someone with a computer science background that can step in and really dig into that with me or with them, we're not going to be doing it until I get good at coding. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that that would be a good way for somebody who was completely blind. Um, oh yeah, well, like there, there are three D modeling because you can code exactly what it is you want. Now, exactly the logistics on how do you? Well, I guess you would educate that having models already printed as you're explaining the code that they can use as a a sensible object for that spatial awareness side of things. Right. So, something I've thought about the, the, the day that I finally do get a grasp on how to use that software is making like a Lego brick kind of kit where you have snippets of objects of, that you have printed that you have tied to code and say, you know, if you combine this with this, it'll make this kind of thing yeah that's something i I never really thought about that yeah but But when it comes to the actual printing side none of the slicers are accessible at all so like 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 in cura or simplify you can't even find the file button do do things like screen readers and stuff would that make slicers more obtainable to some yeah yeah, had- if so, it's so it, with it with it being compatible with it with a screen reading software. It's all just about the back end of the of the actual program and how things are labeled. Um, it's just like with uh, like th- think of like headers and stuff and HTML when you're building a website. Um, how you label things and how it's tagged is the, what determines what the screen reading software actually sees and then conveys to the user. Right. Hmm. So if you want to play with this, if you've got an iPhone, um, it has a screen reader built into it called VoiceOver. 
and you can you can get an idea of it. And Android has their own version of it called Talkback, where you can kind of get an idea of what navigating in a non-visual environment with software, what that interaction looks like. Yeah. Josh, did you have more questions along those lines? Or Paul, Don, um, do you guys have any limited vision or uh, visually impaired students that you have questions for um, Jacob about? But yeah, I just have have an observation. Like as as far as as software is gone, there is still so much more room to uh, for software to grow. And uh, you know, uh, students with disabilities, students who are younger, whatever. Like I think there's room for conversational three D modeling, where just like there's voice to uh, voice to text, where it would be voice to three D model. Hey, I want. Uh, a cylinder this big and having the camera being able to to estimate that size and oh yeah i want it to be hollow and i want the wall thickness to be about that and being able to have software be able to do some of that modeling for you i oh yeah i oh, think the rest of us who've learned cad way lazy <laughs> <laughs> But you know, like a, a verbal version of, of OpenSCAD where like the, the machine is listening to what you're saying and trying as best it can to to create a, a 3D approximation of that could benefit younger students, could uh, benefit people who don't have any modeling experience. And I'm assuming uh, students with, with visual impairments could benefit from that too. Right, well, and that's, that's the beautiful thing about trying to solve these problems is typically, typically with accessibility, if if it makes the life of the person with a disability better overall in the overarching community, it makes everyone else's life a heck of a lot easier. So like I'm, I'm working with a, a engineering design class right now at a local university. And uh, we're, this is one of the problems we're trying to tackle is, um, you know, non-visual printer operation you know, what are, what are sensors and cameras and stuff we can add to them and build programs off of to say, you know, if we're, lo we're looking at this thing and have the machine figure out that crap's hit the fan and your print's about to slide off, you know, visually or non-visually, you don't know that. And, you know, if we get to that level of automation for that group, it's, affected the entire printing community because it's when it comes to automation and things like that the problems that need to be solved work for everyone yeah josh you were talking about the camera recognition voice recognition where you can put your hands up and say i want a, a square this wide by this tall something like that um as you were explaining that it would be neat to see somebody take what they're doing with virtual uh, virtual reality um, headsets now, where you have the sculpting environments and you're using the the nunchucks to or the joysticks in physical space, and you're moving them around to sculpt. Take that, take the visual side out of it. I mean, you you could have it on a, a display or something like that, but wouldn't necessarily need the heads the headset for it. Um, to instead of recognizing you clicking on stuff, you say, I want a square and you have the joysticks in your hand. I want a square this big because those joysticks know where they are in space. That would be kind of interesting. If somebody took VR and went a different route with those the abilities of that. Added right. In. Well, and VR is a, is a cool thing where a lot of low vision people have adopted it for their workflows. So like when, when I CAD at home, I, I have an HTC Vive that I use a virtual desktop thing in to where I can make, I can make my CAD stuff as big or small as I need and focus on fine things and I can sculpt in it if I need to. And I sculpt a hell of a lot better in VR than I do in like ZBrush. I, I think in ZBrush. <laughs> what, what software do you use with your VR? You said about CAD on the VR. Um, so there's a, there, there's a program for um, the HTC Vive called uh, the VR Toolbox. 
And what it lets you do is kind of emulate your living room or office in the software. And it projects in front of you a screen for every program you have running. So like I could have, I could have a, like a 48 inch curved digital monitor in front of me with fusion 360 opened up and um, to the right of that, I can have uh, Google, Google images opened up in another digital window right next to it, just kind of floating in front of me with reference images from the internet. So it's just, it's functioning the same as you would on your normal PC, but I have, I can digitally manipulate what my visual display actually is and bring it closer or further away from me in digital space. So like if I need to make something the size of like an IMAX screen to see it, I can do that in VR. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Chris and Dave, um, or John, too, um, do you guys have questions for our guests? Where do you guys, you know, all of you are, are, are tackling, you know, 3D printing from, from different aspects and how it fits in the programs that you're doing. What do you see as the next, the next, you know, walls that need to be overcome for, for this to become more, um, you know, mainstream, more accessible, more, more people can do it. It gets more exposure. You guys feel free to, to jump in if you have an answer for that. I'll kind of go off the format of picking people out. <laughs> it's an interesting um, question and one I think a lot about because I think about pipeline. If I don't have students, I don't have a job. Um, and Tinkercad and Morphe, um, very attainable, approachable, um, non-threatening, non-complicated hooks are the key and the hook could be uh thundercats or minecraft or cosplay and everybody has their own hook um it's one of the cool things when you work a table at an event is to hear all the different original reasons people got into the hobby um and there are a million stories and they're all slightly different um and everybody kind of does their own thing um and often inspire me in a different way um, because I don't approach things uh, the same as somebody that's more of, I don't approach like Paul does, um, you know, I approach it very different than a lot of other people in the community. Um, but I think a lot about how to recruit in. Um, and uh, one of the cool things I think that Aldi maker did and uh, Liz and uh, Matt, um, at Aldi Maker created that design engine. And um, I just started using that last year. Um, and most people don't think they're creative at all. Um, and we did it at a meetup at Printed Solid. And it was interesting. There were some people there that kind of made their living as designers and weren't threatened at all by that game. And then there are other people that were very kind of like, oh, I'm not going to do this. And then they kind of got sucked in. Um, so I, I think... Um, a lot of times it starts long before a 3D printer's fired up and long before a slicer's opened or there's any teaching on a tool chain. Um, and it's, it's very small, incremental interest things and exposure things. And if somebody's pro headed to a medical career or prosthetics or um, some of the adaptive technologies that Jacob's been talking about, like, whatever that hook is and wherever they're coming from, um, that's going to be the thing that draws them in and gets through the three hours of a problem and you don't know what it is and you don't know how to even ask the right question online community. Therefore, you don't know how to fix it in a reasonable amount of time, you know, and, and three days later, you're just, um, you got to have some hook to get over the learning curve, I think. And, uh, 
So it's kind of a non-answer, but it's something I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and just as a quick aside, not necessarily directed to that question, um, tonight is very interesting because of that um, low vision. Um, I think this fall when I have 25 freshmen that don't have spatial awareness and recognition, I'm going to create, um, I, I'm trying to think about ways I'll create where they can't depend on vision. It's almost like your story, Matt, of when I can't feel where the bolt is and um, I have to close my eyes and then I can visualize. Uh, and I think Paul called it a mental map. Um, so that's something I would have never thought about. But as soon as Jacob started talking about it, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and one of the things I know that I've proved over 30 years is the ability to imagine when a dial indicator tells me a shaft is misaligned by three thousandths in an angular and, and, and I can do it because I've actually gone and drawn things like that in CAD at insanely small detail because after I draw it out and I call it trigging it out, I, it, it kind of connects in my head and now I can imagine what's going on. Um, so sometimes it seems very almost mystical and sometimes it just takes a little bit of hard work and, frustration to kind of get on the other side of being able to do some of these things. So it's something you should try. Um, make, make a lab just all about using Allen keys non-visually. That'll be one of the most entertaining things you will ever see. Just like <laughs> get, drill some holes, put some threaded inserts and stuff and give them a pile of bolts and an Allen key and say, put all of these in there. Can I throw in some that are rounded out? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why not? I like it. Reverse thread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to, to follow up with that idea and, and, and something that Don touched on as well as, as I mean, it seems like a lot of what, what Josh does is is, I think, a lack of rigidity, actually, when it comes to education. Um, you know, don't make them do it just for this singular purpose. Let them explore, let them do basically whatever they want. I mean, I, I let whoever wants to come in and print something in, in my lab, they can, they can do it. I'm not going to stop them. Um, and I think that that's how you, you get engagement. That's how you get them over the sort of that, as, as Don was kind of talking about, you know, some of the, the initial difficulties that you might have in that learning curve. Cause, it's something they're interested in automatically if, if it's something that they want to make. That's a good one. Uh, for you guys, uh, I, I had a question for you. Did you talk about, about all the, the whole spatiality of things? I was curious about um, how do you apply practicality to, I mean, to, to these, uh, these kind of tools and technologies and everything you're teaching? I mean, it's a difficult challenge, it seems like, to get real world applications for the students that they can connect with so quickly. I'm just curious how you guys have attached that. So for me, it, it uh, starts with the journey in the f first semester and then they kind of have a second and third semester where they may not be tapping into some of these things. Um, but in the fourth semester, they have to do a capstone and um, it's very loose requirements to Paul's comment. Just it, I don't tell them what to do as a project. I kind of, there's a free agent draft, so to speak, and, and I kind of set up teams that I think will work, but I kind of let them self-select their own teams and their own project. And it to industry, and industry kind of corrects it, but the only requirements for this capstone is um, that it have multiple energy systems. So usually it's electrical, PLC, um, uh, system, and then it needs a hydraulic uh, a motor, a power transmission. So it's got to have at least two systems. So it's very loose requirements. And um, some of the other faculty at my college hates the way I do it. Um, and it is a little like walking on a tightrope. Um, and we definitely have had some projects that um, have failed um, or not been very successful or, or students have kind of struggled. Um, but overall, I'd say more than 75% and close to 90% some years are exceptional in doing what you just asked about, Dave. Um, 
they take the tools that we gave them. And sometimes the tool is communicating with a machinist and communicating with a welder um, and getting prints and documentation that works for the welder who thinks totally differently than a mechanical designer who thinks totally different than the technician that's got to put the whole machine together. Um, and that lack of rigidity to bounce off of what Paul was just saying creates this very we real world environment and they apply 3D printing when they see the need to it. I don't come in and say, hey, I think you should 3D print that. Um, and I've even learned not to say, I think that's crazy. You shouldn't 3D print that because nine out of 10 times they blow my mind with what they design. And sometimes um, I have a team, uh, Josh, I think mentioned the Philibot. I have a team that did plastic extrusion this year and they actually extruded PLA. It was more like fishing line. It definitely was not 1.75 because their extrusion speed wasn't matched with their winding speed, but it's a really good project starting point for next year. Um, and they, they did more. They literally 3d printed built, uh, MacGyvered up four different winders that didn't work. And the fifth winder worked kind of, and that's the story that got them jobs because of the grit that they had. Um, and, and they applied, they wouldn't have been able to build four that didn't work and find a fifth that did kind of work without 3D printing. And I had almost zero involvement in any of that. And I, the cool thing was they were a team that struggled in January. Um, and I kind of leaned into them January and February. Um, and I didn't even realize until they were doing their presentations at the end that they had four failures. I, you know, I saw some of the progress, but I don't micromanage them. But 3D printing enabled them um, to do something, um, and it didn't involve an instructor. It was self-directed, and it was developing the soft skills that they need for their job. You know, and that kind of makes me think of something that um, I, I've read before, and I, I recently read this again. I can't remember where the article was, but it was talking about um, solutioning for problems and and why children are great for solutioning for problems because um you know as we say you know kids will say the damnedest things you know you ask them you know how to fix something they'll come up with something that's so left field that um you know we at our points of our lives we've seen a lot of things and we just know that's not going to work it's not possible um but but they say if you really want to figure out a problem, give it to kids and let them go at it. Because when they brainstorm, they don't have that training in their mind that says, nope, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. Um, it, it, it's anything goes, anything's on the table, and 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 any of it can work. And and seeing tools like three D printers and CNC mills and and all this, that that brings just the possibilities to a whole different level. And, you know, at some point, I'm sure you all are going to run into a situation where you're going to see something happen um, with kids because they, they haven't been trained to, to think no and, and the tools that are there. And you're probably going to get to see something really, really incredible at some point, uh, you know, if you haven't already. Yeah. Yeah. It kids will leave you with the, they'll say something and at first you're like, no, nah, that won't work. And then you, it's best obviously to try not telling anyone that something won't work just because you don't think it will. But, you know, you get that thought in your head, nah, that's not going to work. And then it's like, oh, wait, maybe it will. Or what would happen if we do it? And like Don was saying with his students, it's kind of, you know, try it. If it works, great you you can impress the instructor or the the professor or whatever um by something that works and if it doesn't work okay that gives you a point where you can analyze it you can step back you can troubleshoot it and you can say okay why didn't it work what can we do differently to make it work um it's it's kind of a lot of us who do tinker with things a lot of us were given the opportunity growing up to just tear stuff apart. If something was broken, we could have at it. If you wanted to figure out how it works, go ahead, tear it apart. It's already broke. You're not going to break it worse. Um, and you might figure out what's wrong with it and you might fix it. I know that's how I 
I, I learned to I'm not afraid to tear into almost anything at this point because of that. Josh, what about what about you as far as um, setting a structure versus just letting things kind of be free flowing with the education of what the kids want to do? How do you guys approach that? Well, I, I mean, I, I think there's training, right? So when you train somebody on how how to drill a hole or uh, cut on a bandsaw, then uh, then you're training to to standard, right? If you're trying to to cut a three inch piece of wood, then it it should measure three inches when it when it comes out, and all of those products should look uh, alike if you're training on the same set of of things. So we uh, we have projects where you know are. Uh, training exercises where they'll they'll cut a piece of wood down to size and they'll drill a hole in it and it all uh, measures and is standardized. But if you're a teacher and you're creating a product and you're not surprised by any of the results, then uh, you're too rigid in formulating the the prompt or the structure of that that activity. If you're asking kids to be innovative and you can anticipate every single uh, uh, thing that they submit then there's something wrong with your process. You should be, um, there should be a diversity in the products. Like if it's a good prompt, if it's a good project, then uh, they should look different from each other and you should be surprised and amazed by it, by some of those projects. If not, again, I, I, I personally think for projects, you're being, being too rigid. Again, for training, sure, you can work to a standard and, and you know, things should look alike, but I don't think we should spend our time making uh, bookends that all all look the same. We should be creating projects where where students are really creating uh, diverse things that uh, kind of amaze and surprise us. Does three D printing is, when you talk about general studies like math, English, history, science? Um, specifically math. Math is the one that really comes to mind where we go education, especially in grade school. I'm not sure so much in college how it is, but grade school goes in waves of, you know, this is how you do addition. Now you have common core math. Now you have this style math. And I know like looking at my daughter who's in first grade, comparing that to not that I exactly remember how we did things in first grade, but you know, when I was in school, grade school, it was, you have to do it this way because you're learning the different techniques on how to do it. Does bringing 3D printing, um, bringing technology in and making STEM stuff into the classroom, does that kind of buck that trend of this is the way you're supposed to do it versus, you know, here, here's how you do it. Now, have at it. Do it, do it however you want. Um, when you talk about math, it's, it's grade school. You have to do it this way to get the answer. Even though you can get the answer another way, this is the way you have to do it. Is the, the STEM, uh, Josh, like what you're doing in grade school, um, does that kind of, how's that interact with the other common um, education stuff, general education? Well, um, I think if you look at the, the education an, uh, landscape, uh, and, and Vent to Learn, written by Sylvia Martinez and, and Gary Steger, they talk about uh, three game changers in education. And those are, are fabrication, physical computing, and programming. So, you know, like coding is, is a, a big thing in our classrooms, right? And really, these are all about kids being able to uh, uh, design for and control and influence um, all of these tools of our of our modern age, right? And so, um, what's really interesting and and the challenge I think in, in the STEM field is not just to be a consumer, but how do you um, how do you make things in the world today? And digital fabrication. There's going to be a robot uh, from nanoscale structures up to rocket engines. Nowadays, it's a robot controlling a thing. Right on the cover of Science, they're building a 3D printer that can construct a, a vascular system uh, for living organisms, right? So they they had blood flow and oxygen flow, right? And so uh, fabrication, uh, 
physical computing devices are in all of the things, right? Internet of things, and then actually being able to do the, the software side and programming of things. And I think actually 3D printing has all of those elements in it, right? If you build a 3D printer, you have the physical computing, you have the software layer, and then you're actually fabricating stuff. And so I think from a STEM perspective, those are all skills uh, that, that kids need to have um, to make things in our in our modern world. And I think the 3D printer is a good proxy for that, that works in the scale of the classroom. Um, and knowing that once they graduate, and depending on the field, that tool might look very different, but some of the skill sets and processes and, and approaches that we use for, for 3D printing in, in the classroom are gonna work in biotechnology and, and rocket science and, and car design and all of those other places. Anybody else have any input on that? All right, um, we are at the two hour mark. Um, I just like to offer to our guests, I know when we discussed the stream, I did say that it, Typically, we go for two hours. Um, if any of you guys want to cut loose, if all of you want to cut loose, um, I'll leave it up to the guests whether we continue to discuss it, um, as well as panels, uh, panelists, John, Dave, Chris, if you guys have other questions. Um, those of you in the chat, if you have questions, um, now's a good time to get those posted because we don't want to overstay our welcome with the guests and uh, keep them too long. I know. Don said he's like usually in bed by seven. So <laughs> Don, Don's almost asleep now. I know. I, every now and then I, he's looking down and I'm like, uh oh, Don might have fell asleep. <laughs> I, I got to get up in a few hours and milk the cows. So, like, there I got to sleep at some point. Yeah. So, I it, don't feel like you guys have to stay. If you want to cut out, be my guest, um, just let me know. Since it is the two hour mark, um, let's go ahead and do outros starting with our guests and guys um if you have social media followings uh youtube and stuff tell everybody where they can find you on social media if you're um published anywhere let people know where they can find your publications um anything you got anything you want people to know and how to find you so let's start in the reverse order that we did the guests and we'll start out with jacob You're muted, Jacob. Well, um, friend me on Facebook, and uh, I'm sort of active on Twitter. My Twitter handle is the Blind Cad Guy. Um, so, yeah, I, I pretty much pump everything to Facebook, though. So, if you're in any of the major groups, you'll probably see it. All right. Uh... I said reverse order, but things rearranged at the bottom. So let's go over to Paul. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Um, so Paul Poxtelis, you can find me on Twitter, uh, P Poxtelis. And as Matt mentioned, I have like very sparse videos uh, on YouTube under my name. So you can find me there. Um, mostly molecular modeling things and my various printer creations that I make um, out of old lab equipment. So, and thanks for having me. And if you'd like to talk with Paul, uh, Jacob, I think you might be too. Um, if you guys are going to be at the East Coast Rep Rep Festival in October, um, yeah. let everybody know that, that they can come and find you. I know they're pushing for Earth to get uh, more educators there. Um, so if you are watching the stream and you want to talk to these guys more, about 3d printing in education or even just the whole general topic of making in education or stem um these are some really creative guys that are using technology to the advantage of the students so um if you guys are going to be at or if paul you'll be there i'm sure i will be there yes jacob will you be there if i have a ride for me and my stuff from indiana i'll be there <laughs> okay um and on and uh Josh, if you guys are going to be there too, feel free to to let everybody know that as you're doing your outro. Sorry, Paul, I don't, were you done? I don't know if I interrupted you or not. Okay. <laughs> Next up, we've got Don. All right, am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah uh, I will muted. be at Earth. Looking forward to it. 
Um, Chris and I have bounced around some things. We've been recruiting um, one of the professors at the community college that hosts Earth, um, and then I'm working on Ann Arundel Community College. Um, so some of these, especially rep rap minded, um, is I'm really trying to hope to get there. And then um, obviously K through 12, you know, all education wise should hopefully come to Earth and we'll figure out how to track ourselves. Um, I don't know what the Earth team is thinking about, but um, I think there is a specific set of uh, challenges. It's inspiring to be around um, people like Josh and Paul um, at Construct 3D um, and just kind of figure out what people are doing in the classroom and get, um, ins you know, just great ideas from what other people are doing and not doing the hard stuff and falling uh, forward. So, um, yeah, so Earth, I'll be there. Can't wait. Um, I pretty much have two channels, Twitter, Don Dagan, so pretty straightforward, D-O-N-D-A-G-E-N, and then LinkedIn. Um, you should be able to find me just with my name. Um, so those are kind of my main two channels. Um, I wanted to find my channel. I have, I think, five or six videos up from school, um, and I can't find it, the keywords. I just started putting some YouTube videos up on the mechatronics projects, but um, if I can that link, I'll put it into the live feed. I'm, I'm going to sign off here um, after everybody says goodbye. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to do this every Friday, but tonight worked out good, and um, I'll tell you, I, I, I'm pretty excited about the stuff Jacob kind of plus seeds in my head. So thanks so much, everyone. I just posted Don's YouTube channel in chat. You're muted again, Don. That's probably <laughs> my personal one, not my school. One, I'll put it in the chat link the the other one as soon as i find it okay um when you do find it send me a direct message on twitter with it and i'll be sure to get it down in the description okay cool all right thanks don next up we've got josh uh hey everybody uh so if you want to see my most current stuff it's uh probably twitter uh at design make teach is, is the best place you're going to see pretty much daily photos of whatever's on the 3d print bed or the cnc uh just got an ultimaker s5 and so uh hopefully I, i'll have some time to unbox that next week and and kind of uh, push the buttons on on that a little bit. Uh, I do have designmaketeach.com, which has a uh, a wide repository of of stuff, and I have a, a nice portfolio of educational related designs on Thingiverse and some some YouTube videos on uh, the Design Make Teach uh, YouTube channel. Um, if you have an educator in your your life, uh, Meaningful Making Two by the Fab Learn Fellows has has tons of stuff about why making in the classroom, why digital fabrication. And the first uh, chapter is about my my zero things talk about encouraging diversity, opportunity, and, uh, and 3D printing by having students find things that are missing uh, about themselves, uh, their identity, heritage, and culture in uh, repositories like Thingiverse, and actually designing and making and publishing a thing. And that works for every content area. Like if, if you're a teacher and you find that there's not a thing there, well then have your students research, uh, design something and actually publish it. So instead of there being zero things, there'll be, uh, be lots of things. Uh, I will be at uh, Nova Maker Fair, um, Earth, and uh, I encourage everybody, if you're uh, interested in an academic 3D printing conference, uh, Construct 3D um, is will be at Rice University uh, in 2020, and that's um, a, a real exciting conference to go to. Josh, Meaningful Making, uh, one and two. I saw there on Amazon as well. Who's supported by, who all gets supported by purchases of the book? I know it's available for free. Yeah, the, the PDF is free and was funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, the FabLearn Fellows are a cohort of global educators um, and on, and a small portion of, of whatever you buy goes goes back to the, uh, the FabLearn organization. So we have 
have fellows in Germany and Africa and, and uh, all over. And sometimes the, the money helps uh, for stipends for travel to, to come to academic conferences like uh, FabLearn 2019, which was held at Columbia University uh, this past winter. All right. I, oh, YouTube. Don't. Hang on a second. <laughs> I posted the link for the, the book in the chat. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to give me one second here. There we go. I posted a link uh, to if you want to support the FabLearn fellows and everybody that the purchases of the book go to. John posted a link, uh, fablearn.org slash fellows, meaning of making. Is that correct, Josh? That's the, the URL uh, for it. Yeah, yeah, meaningful making. But but again, if you know any teacher or educator, just send them the PDF, and then if they, they like it, uh, people sometimes will buy the book. But uh, it, it's important just, you know, uh, if people, like you said, have that question, why 3D printers, why making, um, sometimes they just need a, a book or something. Invent to Learn is a, is a good book. Um, if you have people who are on the art side, there's the art of uh, digital fabrication, which has a, uh, a lot of really hands-on, cool, cool stuff. Uh, it's nice because it's super visual and it does a lot of stuff with laser cutting and uh, CNC in addition to, to the 3D printing. So. Okay. All right. Next up. Where's my mouse? Uh, next up, we've got John. I'll go to you since you didn't get to do an intro either, uh, when you jumped on. Hi, it's uh, John. What do you do? I do a lot of making and 3D printing. Um, my videos lately have been on helping others grow their YouTube channel. I've been participating in Vid Summit and Video Marketing World and communicating with people like Owen Hemseth and Daryl Eaves. So if you have any questions about trying to grow your channel and getting your videos out there so that they're discoverable. Cause you can make a video and it'll give you the best thing in the world. But if you don't do the proper SEO and titles and stuff, it just won't get discovered. And that's the real reason why we do this stuff is so that we have a chance to inspire somebody else. And then that person will return the favor to the community and do something even better. So you can find me on uh, you underscore do underscore it on Twitter. Thanks. Thanks John. Next up, we've got David Randolph. Hey, David Randolph, you know, over at Prince Hall, all that fun stuff. And uh, yeah, we like to help out. And I have a lot of fun with uh, my educational customers, primarily because uh, we get hit up by all of them for all of their uh, safety and insurance compliance. So most of my entertainment, most of my time with educators is just sitting down with their safety officers to make sure the kids don't uh, lose a finger. <laughs> awesome. And where can everybody find you, Dave? Over at printedsolid.com or on Twitter at printedsolid.com or Facebook at printedsolid.com. If you haven't guessed, uh, printedsolid.com. <laughs> right. And I, I do have to say, we get our uh, fab, our, we get the, uh, the economy rolls from, oh, who does them? Um, they color are, fab. yeah, color fab, and they are, are super awesome. They they print well. They're the only place that I found that really has those huge rolls, and it saves me so much time to have have a big spool and not have to change those seven hundred and fifty gram ones like every uh, every other day. So, by the way, did you know we actually just released all of our Jesse filament on a two point three kilogram spools too? So you have to check out that one because it's a really good one for that. Super awesome. All right, thanks, Dave. Next up, we've got Chris. Hey, everybody. Uh, Chris here from the Earth team. Uh, you can find me personally at, M at mcrispy1 on Twitter. Uh, please give us a follow uh, for Earth uh, at Earth2018. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and pop up uh, the link uh, for our Eventbrite. You can get your tickets for Earth today. Uh, See you in a couple months. All right. And that brings me back. It brings it back to me. 
Um, I'm Matt from How I Do It. Uh, I just recently, for How I Do It, actually recently being this week, uh, launched a new website for How I Do It where I'm doing blog posts about making. Um, you're going to find a lot of different stuff on there. Um, I'm trying to get myself set in a, a rhythm of having at least one post a week um, about something that I learned that week. Um, between my job, between making, I'm always learning new things. I mean, that's what always drives my interest is when I don't understand something or there's something I don't know how to do. That's what keeps me interested in learning how to do it. Um, so it may sometimes be just general knowledge things that I've learned through the week. It may be how I, um, just yesterday I posted how I'm actually last night, um, posted how I have a CR 10 doing repetitive 3d printing where it's printing 20 sets of two items autonomously. It prints two, um, cools the printer down moves the head, knocks the print off the bed, has G-code examples of how I did that. And that printer I actually left for work this morning. I wrote that blog post without fully testing everything. I left for work this morning and realized that I never started the printer. So when I got to work, I started the printer and then again, got distracted and forgot to check on it until about two o'clock this afternoon, checked on it and had a pile of parts laying in front of the printer on the camera. Um, so there's a blog post about how, how to do that. Um, that's kind of what I'm going to be doing. I mean, it, it might be woodworking. It might be woodwork, yeah, might be woodworking, might be metalworking, uh, electronics, 3d printing might be car stuff. Sometimes it might even be HVAC stuff because that's what I do in a professional environment. Um, so just a, a, a repository for things I learned. Um, you can find me on Twitter, twitter.com slash country cowboy youtube uh youtube.com slash how i do it and of course how i do it.tv is the new website um for the friday night hangouts again if you didn't catch the beginning of the stream we have a, also as of this week um, a new website for the friday night hangouts and i want to give a shout out to 3d medic vince on twitter um he actually sponsored the initial funding to get the website up and going as well as getting the podcast up and going uh, to begin with. If you would like to support the Friday night hangouts, what I've done with my personal Patreon for how I do it, um, all the funding right now on my Patreon is going to support the Friday night hangouts. Um, paying for the website, I have a goal set of $40 a month to pay for the website. Um, the web domain each year, as well as uh, the podcast. Without some funding, I'm not sure that I'll be able to sustain doing all of that all the time, um, especially when things come into the winter and bills, heating bills come around and things like that. Um, so if you would like to support the Hangouts, um, you can find me on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash how I do it, I think. Um, that supports everything right now is going to support the Friday Night Hangouts. Uh, and the other new thing that we've had since the last uh, U.S. hangout is there is now every Monday after the Friday night hangout, we'll be uploading to SoundCloud an audio only version of the stream that you can listen to on SoundCloud. You can search Google podcast or Google Play Music and find the Friday night hangouts. Uh, just search F3D PCH. You can search on Spotify as well as um, tune in. And I'm working on the Apple uh, podcast app, the app store that you can find it on Apple Music podcast. Um, with that, the website is f3dpch.com. Go there. You can find the links to everything Friday night 3D printing community hangout. The next Friday night hangout is the European version. That is on May 24th, hosted by 3D Printed Iceland. And they, as far as I'm, I know, they haven't picked a topic yet for that one. Uh, this last one, they interviewed Luke Daly. Uh, Luke and his wife, I believe it is, um, make 3D printed props 
and do casting. So 3D printing is a tool in their workflow. A lot of times their 3D print is not the final product. Um, you can go back and catch that one from May 10th. Their next one's May 24th. The next U.S. stream is May 31st at 10 p.m. Eastern. And you can find us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Friday 3D Printing Community Hangout. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's joined us, both our, all our guests, our panelists, as well as everybody in the chat who's joined us tonight. And uh, Don, I know you said you wanted to cut out. Um, how's everybody feel? Do you guys want to keep on going? Do you just want to go ahead and end things here? Um, what's the feelings of everybody? I'm taking off. I gave my final exam this morning, so I'm very tired. Okay. <laughs> it sounds good. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Thank right, you. Paul. Yeah, I, I'm uh, running a workshop at a, a hackathon uh, tomorrow, and I 3D printed these little micro bit uh, badge holders, so the kids are going to be hacking their own little micro bit badges. So I think Thank I'm you. out too for tonight. Nice. Thanks for joining us, Josh. Hey, Josh. Good luck with that tomorrow, man. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. See you, Josh. All right, buddy. All right. I think, um, Jacob, do you want to, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about with what you guys do? Um, I, I kind of, with the things you've been talking about tonight, um, I text Chris. I'm not sure if he saw it or not. I think I did. Like to set up a 3D printing for disability assistance uh, stream. I think you would probably be a good person to have one about that, how 3D printing can help people with disabilities. Yeah, um, I, I have a friend um, that I would love to bring in on that too. Um, there's a professor here in, Indian in Indianapolis that uh, teaches a doctorate program in uh, occupational therapy, and she does all kinds of uh, research into uh, practical desktop printed orthesis and assistive devices and stuff too. So she'd be a perfect person for that as well. Awesome. Yeah. I think just as you were talking about it, it, it kind of, I realized there's a whole area there that, you know, a lot of us just don't understand because we don't necessarily have a disability that uh, like um, being visually challenged or, um, things that we just don't think about that right. 3D can help with. So I, I think I'll be messaging you after the stream later on this weekend about setting something up. Um, probably get you and a couple other people on as well. Sounds good. So did you have, you start, I kind of interrupted you with that. Did you have any, anything more that you wanted to talk about with 3D printing in the classroom? Um, no, not really. <laughs> if, if if you've got experience in designing labs, get in touch with me because I'm I'm open to all ideas right now. <laughs> we are we are going into lab iteration number five or six starting next month. <laughs> so we have, a, we have a lot of stuff, and we need to figure out how to how to make it work. Cool. So, Steve, John, did you guys have anything else? No, if you want to end it now, I'm, I'm okay with that. I joined late. Yeah, no, I'm, it's a long day here. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I hear you. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap this one up tonight. Um, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you again to our, our guests as well as the panelists. Thank you, everybody, for uh, giving your time to us tonight. And to those of you re-watching or listening on the podcast, thank you for um, coming by and checking out what we had to talk about tonight. We'll see you guys next week on the European stream or on the uh, May 24th, or else we'll see you on May 31st back here at 10 p.m. Eastern. Have a good night, everybody. Great. Goodbye.